desperation hard time in conversation no one should ever love me like you do sometimes my bad decisions define my false suspicion no one should ever love me like you do So sick and tired of everything I've tried to fill my heart. You're the only one I Checking need. The microphone. You okay. always satisfy the emptiness inside. You're my constant conversation, my hello and house. goodbye. Huh? And in my darkest night, you love me yeah, back so. to life. Oh, your words are my salvation, my perfect peace of mind. You make me feel alive, the only one. You're the only one who makes me feel alive, the only one. You're the only one who makes me feel alive. No one else knows me like you. You're my clarity when I can't find the truth. You turn down the noise, whisper your voice to tell my heart. You're the only one I satisfy the emptiness inside from my constant conversation my hello and goodbye and in my darkest night you love me back to life for oh, your words are my salvation my perfect peace of mind you make me feel alive the only one the only good morning everybody it's so good to see your faces today let's stand Let's come with expectancy that he is here, that he is present. Let's lift his name today. Let's sing together. Come on.
Though the storms may come, great is God's faithfulness. You know, many times we hear worship leaders, I've been accused of this and done this before, we say, leave everything out there when you come and worship, leave all those problems. I think the invitation for us today is bring it in here. Let's be real with God and bring some of the difficult things that are going on. And we just wanted to pause for a few minutes and just think about many in our community, Google and many other places. I remember talking with some of our worship team members and people with the threat of losing their jobs. And we've had so many people impacted. Together as a community, let's just pause and take a moment and pray for those folks. So would you bow your heads with me? Father, we know we come into this building today and there are loved ones, friends and family who are facing that um, no job. And maybe they have a little bit of extension with that, God, but maybe they're having to hold on to the promises that you provide, that the storms may come, but God, uh, you still the waves. And so we pray for them. We pray for their families. God, would you bring provision to them? Would you put them in the right place? Would you bring financial uh, stability and help for them? I pray for those coworkers who now maybe have to carry the load and the heaviness of that. And God, I pray that you would come up underneath them with your strength, with, your, with your, your power, Lord, and give them the ability to cope in that kind of way. God, we just pray, would you be their provision? Would you be their provider? Looking out for them, shepherd them through this experience, we pray. God, we also can't help but notice what we see in the news with shootings, the shootings last, uh, last week um, down in SoCal in Monterey Park. And even here in our own neighborhood in Half Moon Bay, one of the deadliest shootings in San Mateo County. God, I, I've heard people who have come from other places, uh, even from UK, say, I don't understand the shootings in the States. I don't understand them. And we don't either, God. They confuse us. Lord, I just pray, help those families who now have that bitterness of losing a loved one. God, I pray that your comfort and your peace would somehow uniquely fall on them. God, I pray that in some ways, the light of Christ through your community, through your church, would somehow minister in a loving way to those people. Father, I just even remember reading this last week, that one of the, the greatest anxieties that parents have is for their kids' physical safety and mental health. And so, Father, we're looking to you. Keep our loved ones safe. But ultimately, we trust and we lean and we rely on you. You can move mountains in our lives. You can minister to us in deep and profound ways. And Father, I pray for all the folks who come in today, and they've got their own struggles. There's stuff that they're wrestling with. We don't want to just leave it outside. We bring it to you. This is who we really are. This is really what we bring. God, would you come as we sing these songs? Would you just breathe into us? Just breathe into us the spirit of calm, confidence, and trust in you. Though we may not know what tomorrow brings, we know who holds the future. Help us to hold on to that. In Jesus' name, amen.
you never fail me yet. Grab a seat. This is my confidence. Everybody say confidence. Ah, oh, we press into that today. We press into that. My breath prayer the last few weeks have been just trusting, trusting, trusting. I breathe in, trusting, just looking to God and trusting Him. Well, welcome, welcome. It's good to see you. I love sitting up there and hearing you all sing. Sounds, sounds so good. Just want to welcome those who are joining us online. It's good to have you with us today as well. If you are new you know what, there's something going on this afternoon. I'm wondering why it's so full this morning. I'm just, uh, help me out here with this. What, uh, okay, enough of that, enough of that. If you are new, this is your first time with us. We're just a regular group of kind of goofy people. I know, we're a regular group of people just trying to follow the ways of Jesus. Walking in the dust of the master is one of the ancient ideas that was, that, uh, was given. And so we're just trying to follow in the ways of Jesus. So we're really glad that you're taking some time to be, uh, be with us. If you'd like to take any next step with us, there's a welcome table uh, right on the way out there. And they would love to answer any questions that you have, um, kind of help you with any kind of next steps. Uh, so feel free uh, to do that. I want to give you a few minutes. I read something actually even this morning. Do you know uh, the ancient, uh, in the ancient language, the word for hospitality, the word for hospitality means lover of the stranger. Lover of the stranger. So we usually take a few minutes in our gatherings just to say hi to somebody we've never met before. So I know you probably got folks you came with. You've already said hi to them. Come on. Find somebody you've never met before. Just introduce yourself. Let's just kind of hang out for a few minutes. Would you stand together with me?
Oh, I love it. I just love the sound of y'all just kind of hanging out, having a good time. So good. Hey, you guys, you got to help me out, okay? We have the best ushers in the free world, but they're freaking right now. So you got to help me out. They want us all to scoot in. And I saw some folks over here doing it. Thank you so much. If you scoot to the middle, then it'll help all these dear folks trying to find a seat. And it's our way of loving our ushers. Ushers, we love you. We love you. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We're going to get into, into our teaching in just a moment, but I just want to pitch one thing to you guys. Just throw this out, okay? Um, I want to introduce you just to a couple folks. Uh, this guy is Miguel, right? And you can throw it up there. Yeah, this is Miguel and Angel. Come on, right? <laughs> You might have seen Miguel around. He helps in a lot of ways. He serves in our church. Listen to what he says. Somebody, I just asked him for a quote. He says, I enjoy pouring into the students. He serves with uh, middle school. I enjoy pouring into the students and seeing them grow in their relationship with God. I consider it a great privilege to help lead students at Westgate Church. I love it. I just, the joy that he uh, experiences. And then, this is one of our love dots. I've known her for a number of years. She, you can't help Val. Everybody say, hey, Val. Yeah. There you go. This, <laughs> yeah, that's nice. It's, she says this. I just gave, got a quote from her. It brings me great joy to serve on our amazing usher team because it's important to me to serve our Lord. God's blessed me with a gift, true love for people. Nothing makes me happier than to be around other believers and those who are seeking to know God. Being an usher Maybe a small part of the entire body. <laughs> oh, my thing's good. But even simple things as answering questions and helping people find seeds gives me great joy. And I just share that with you because uh, that's when, when folks serve here, it, we're, we love, we just don't want to fill a hole. We just want to plug something in. We want to find the gifts that you have, the gifts that I have, and find ways that are meaningful uh, to serve God. So I just invite you, if you would ever kind of like to take some next steps with us, um, if you go to westgatechurch.org slash serve. I looked on it this morning. There's just tons of places where you can serve. And the, the thought is this. What gifts has God given me? What brings me great joy? Do you love being with people? Great. Do you not? Don't be an usher. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> But if you do, uh, plug in with us. Fine. What are the, you know, one of the things I loved is playing sports. And I learned early on that you can use sports to share the gospel. I went overseas and played over there. And it was so cool to see the things I was passionate about marry along with the joy that I had for serving God. So check that out. I'd love to have you do that. Today, I'm really excited. We're going to dive into a really uh, great teaching uh, around loving God's word, studying God's word. My Bible college president used to always say, don't you folks ever read your Bible? Just challenging us. And so today we're going to just have a one-off, uh, a, a challenge from Jay to dig in, to eat God's word is what we've said. So uh, let's watch this video and kind of start off our time together. Uh, the, the Bible is uh, the word of God. And, uh, you know, if you want to follow Jesus, uh, you need to start by reading the Bible. My name is Sebastian Girard. I've been uh, coming to Westgate for 10 years. What was the most challenging about reading the Bible? Um, I mean, the Bible is a big collection of books. It can look um, challenging, but regarding, you know, the challenging part, it helps being part of a group to uh, stay motivated and uh, get insights from them. We, we're influenced by our surroundings, by what you see, by what you hear, and uh, with your interaction with people, the daily reading really, really helps you focus on what's important, loving people, loving God. Every single day, you spend time with Him, right? You can reflect on his word, it just helps you uh, become more mature as a Christian, understand why Jesus teaches some of his uh, comments. You know, Jesus said, if you love me, follow my comments, follow my teachings. And um, that's why I think everybody should, you know, read the Bible and every day, get something 
from God. Yeah, I love that story from Sebastian. Um, I love his French accent. I just love everything about it. <laughs> if you know Sebastian, he's awesome. He's an amazing guy. Um, love him dearly. And Sebastian is a part of uh, something called Discover the Bible. It's actually uh, something we do here at our church. Some of you may know of it. May, many of you probably don't. Uh, it's a cohort of people who say, yeah, you know, I want to take up the challenge and just see if I could read the entire Bible in a year, which is very daunting. Um, but we've had dozens of people go through that. So we've had dozens of people in our church in the last couple of years read the entire Bible beginning to end in a year. And Sebastian's just one of those people. So I'll talk more about that here in a moment. But like Mark said, I want to spend a little bit of time today just before we get into uh, um, some of our compassion immersion stuff that'll start next Sunday where we celebrate God's work all over our city and our world. Uh, I just want to take one day to talk about the Bible and the Word of God. And to do that, let me begin with um, just an experience, a story of my life. Uh, several years ago, a friend of mine texted me urgently one day, and he said, hey, next Saturday, I am taking a speed reading class. It's $200 for one day, and their guarantee is that once you take this class for one day, you'll be able to read at minimum 100 pages an hour. So I thought to myself, wow, that seems pretty amazing. A hundred pages an hour minimum. That seems kind of worth 200 bucks a day. So I thought about it for a while, and then uh, I did a little bit of inter internet research, and I quickly realized speed reading is not really a thing. Um, and some of you, maybe you paid lots of money to take a speed reading class. I'm so sorry. It's not a thing. Uh, Mark Seidenberg, who is a psychologist and an author, he's done a lot of research on speed reading. And he says this, there is a trivial sense in which these texts are being read rapidly, but there is very little being comprehended. We should call this quote unquote reading or sort of reading rather than speed reading. The allure of speed reading makes sense in a culture like ours that emphasizes efficiency and speed, right? And as a result, you and I, culturally, maybe not you specifically, but most people you know, we are losing, as a, as a culture and society, we are losing our ability to read long-format texts. This is not conjecture. Pew Research did a survey uh, about a year ago, and 77% of American adults, almost 80% of American adults admit that in the last year, they have not read a single book in its entirety. Some of you feel really judged right now. You're like, oh my gosh, don't judge me. There's no guilt here. This is not really about, are you a reader? Read lots of books. That's not what we're talking about. Mostly, I point this out because this reality that we are quickly as a society losing our aptitude for patiently and deeply diving into long format texts this, this poses an immense challenge for Christians specifically. Why? Because for followers of Jesus, the story of our faith is most clearly and compellingly told through the Bible, which is a library, as Sebastian said, of 66 long format books. Now, listen. For the next 30 minutes, I'm going to talk about the Bible and the importance of reading the Bible, but I want to make it really clear here. This is not about coercive guilt. So if that is like, because some of us have, um, I, I sort of had this, this tradition. I grew up and I had a beautiful church upbringing, but um, I grew up in sort of like an old school Baptist uh, um, immigrant church. And one of the things I learned there, uh, I, I felt immense guilt throughout periods of my childhood, like, if you're a good Christian, you have to do X, Y, and Z. One of those things was like, read the Bible. Now, in some ways, I agree with that. But what I disagree with, it's not about performatively becoming a good Christian, right? As we're going to see, there is a beautiful invitation from God to hear him speaking through the scriptures. But maybe that's your experience. I just want you to know, this is not, I'm not trying to guilt you into action. There should be freedom in our engagement of listening to God speaking through his word. This isn't about coercive guilt. This is primarily about God's invitation to you to listen to his voice. 
that he has spoken and is speaking and he wants to talk to you. And he does that most compellingly through the scriptures. It's just an invitation. Um, the late great historian Larry Hurtado uh, in his book Destroyer of the Gods, which is the greatest book title of all time, he says this, the Christianity is, he's just a historian, right? He says, Christianity is a bookish faith. Both the importance and the impact of corporate reading of scripture writings are evident from the outset of the Jesus movement. As a historian, Hurtado recognized, as did, as do many biblical historians, that the Christian faith was built upon the corporate reading of Scripture. Not just that, but that was a key tenet in the early days of the Christian movement, and still obviously today. So what does the Bible itself say about itself? Just a few examples. 2 Timothy 3, all Scripture is God-breathed. Romans 15, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Matthew 24, heaven and earth, these are Jesus' words, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Ancient text, Isaiah 55, my word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. These are just a few examples of what the Bible says about itself. What about early church fathers and the first few centuries of the Christian movement? What did they say about the scriptures, about the Bible? By the will of God, they delivered to us in the scriptures to be, for the future, the foundation and pillar of our faith. That's Arrhenius. Athanasius said, the holy scriptures given by inspiration of God are of themselves sufficient toward the discovery of truth. Or Cyril of Jerusalem. The security and preservation of our faith are not supported by ingenuity of speech, but by the proofs of the divine scriptures. Now I wanna make another point here. I know that in a room this size, and for those watching in the theater or online, there are probably some of us who don't necessarily believe what many Christians believe, that the Bible is the divinely inspired word of God, that it is active and alive and God-breathed, as we read in the Timothy text. Some of us are here, and honestly, we would say, like, listen, I'm not a Christian. I'm not religious. I'm actually quite skeptical or cynical. Or maybe, like, I'm curious. I'm seeking. I'm searching. First, I say this often here. First, if that is you, we are so grateful and glad you're here. It's not an easy thing for someone to walk into a room like this with a bunch of people who believe one thing and then participate when you don't believe what they believe. So thank you for coming. We are thrilled you're here. Whatever you need in terms of your faith journey, let us know. We would love to come alongside you. But even if you do not believe that the Bible is the divine word of God, let's just take a look at it from an in, like a non-religious, non-Christian uh, perspective. First, let me show you a graphic. This is just a very quick graphic about sort of like the reliability of Scripture. This does not mean like the reliability you believe it's the divinely inspired Word of God, just the reliability of the text itself, that the, the texts that we have are actually accurate and true, at least in their own original literary form. You can see the list here. These incredibly famous uh, works of literature like the Iliad or the works of Plato or Aristotle. And you could see how many copies of these texts we have today. Around 1,800 copies of Homer's Iliad, 200 or so copies of Plato's works, 40 copies of Aristotle. And then you get down to just the New Testament. 5,800 copies. 5,800. I share this with you because this should not convince you that this is the divinely inspired word of God. I am only letting you know the Bible is a significant literary text. It is an important historical text. Let me show you the next graphic. 
This is a visual graphic showing you from beginning to end, on the far left would be Genesis 1-1, on the far right would be the final words of the book of Revelation, the first book of the Bible and the last book of the Bible, and every line that you see, this kaleidoscopic rainbow that you see, do you know what this represents? It represents every, now remember, these texts from beginning to end, they were written across the span of thousands of years. And the lines represent every time that these authors cite or prophetically speak to one another. This is the interconnectedness of the library of books we call the Bible. There is not a single text in literary history that would look like this in terms of its interconnectedness. Not a single one. This is not a religious point I'm making. This is simply a historical literary point I'm making. So if you are here and you are not a Christian, you do not believe that the Bible is the divine word of God, that is perfectly okay. I understand we want to come alongside you in your journey. My invitation to you is this. Even if the Bible is not the word of God, it is, I would suggest to you, the single most important work of literature in human history, and it is not even close. So if that is true, I would suggest it deserves your attention, way more than Twitter or your newsfeed. So even if you are not a Christian, I would suggest to you, take a step and explore. So for Christians, though, which many of us in the room are, This is vital. The Bible is vital. It is for us. We believe the divinely inspired word of God spoken for us to lead us in the way of truth and love down the path toward God's glory and our good. But this isn't just about intellectual assent. It's not just about knowing more. It's about transformation. For Christians, we engage the scriptures, we read and deep dive into the Bible uh, on our own, but also within the context of community because we believe it has the power, God has the power through his words to change and transform us. The theologian Scott McKnight puts it this way. He says, God did not give the Bible so we could master him or it. God gave the Bible so we could live it, so we could be mastered by it. The moment we think we've mastered it, the Bible, we have failed to be readers of the Bible. So how do we invite God to transform us and master us through the scriptures? About 600 years before the birth of Jesus, there was a man named Ezekiel. And God calls this man, Ezekiel, to be his prophet, essentially to speak on behalf of God to his people. And this is how God invites Ezekiel to speak on his behalf. Ezekiel chapter 2. This is Ezekiel writing. He has this vision of heaven. He says, Then I looked and I saw a hand stretched out to me. In it was a scroll, which he unrolled before me. And on both sides of it were written words of lament and mourning and woe. And he said to me, Son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll. Then go and speak to the people of Israel. So I opened my mouth, not to speak, but to eat. He gave me the scroll to eat. Then he said to me, Son of man, Eat this scroll I am giving you and fill your stomach with it. So, Ezekiel says, I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. This is interesting because if you go back a few verses, it actually says that on both sides of the scroll were written words of what? Anyone remember? Lament, mourning, and woe. And yet Ezekiel eats the scroll and it's sweet as honey. Then he, God, said to me, son of man, go now to the people of Israel and speak my words to them. God doesn't give Ezekiel the scroll to carry, unroll, and read to the people. God gives Ezekiel, his prophet, his words to eat and then to go and speak. I do wonder sometimes pastorally, we are a talking generation. Everybody has something to say, and you can scream into the digital ether as quickly as your thumbs can type, right? But I wonder if we are speaking from emptiness. 
I do wonder if as Christians, maybe the best thing to do is to shut our mouths for a moment and to take in God's word first and then to speak with sweetness, sweetness of honey. That wasn't in my notes. That was just a sidebar. So the word of God is most powerful and effective and transformative, not when we hold it or have it on a bookshelf, but when it is what? When it is in us. So how? How does that work? A few thoughts from the scriptures themselves. First, the word of God, the Bible, is bread. The word of God is bread. You know, we've been in a series through Matthew for over a year now. We're taking these little breaks, but we've been in Matthew, trucking along. We're through chapter 7, right? And uh, we read months ago in chapter 4, Jesus goes into the wilderness and he's tempted by the devil. And what happens? Matthew 4, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he, Jesus, was hungry, obvious, right? And the tempter, the devil, came to Jesus and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus is actually quoting here from an ancient text called Deuteronomy, which tells the story of the Israelites being rescued out of slavery in Egypt and led through the wilderness to the promised land. And during that journey, they run out of food. And what does God do? God sends them food. Deuteronomy 8, what does it say? God, he humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna right, the magical bread from heaven, which neither you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. The word of God is bread. Now, some of you are wondering right now, okay, Jay, that sounds poetic and nice, but if I really eat that leather-bound book on my shelf, what are you talking about? Some of you know in the world of psychology, some of you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Do you guys know this chart? Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? You know this? Uh, Basically, this is um, Abraham Maslow, 20th century um, psychologist. This is not a Christian thing. It's It's just very popular in the world of psychology. Maslow's hierarchy of needs is basically a pyramid that shows you how human beings prioritize their behavior, their motivations, uh, and and their, their actions, right? And it's a pyramid because what Maslow said correctly, I believe, is that at the very base of the pyramid, the thing you need to build further on the pyramid is what he would call physiological needs. So food, water, air. Right? You, you get what I'm saying. Let's say you and a friend are, um, gosh, like lounging around by the pool near the deep end, just with your feet in the water, and you're having long existential talks about life and meaning and purpose, and it's really beautiful. But let's say your friend doesn't know how to swim, and she's not wearing a life jacket, and you're like, oh, so funny, and you tap her on the back, and she falls into the deep end of the pool. And she's drowning. At that point, if you looked at her and said, No, but seriously, tell me, like, what do you think the meaning of life is? What would she do? She doesn't care at that point about the meaning of life or existential conversations, right? What she wants is what? Breathable air. She needs, like, help. She's like, what? Who cares about the meaning of life? I'm about to lose my life. Please pick me up out of this water. Okay, that's the whole point of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You need the basic stuff to continue trekking on. Does that make sense? Okay, but... But Maslow's point is really fascinating. He says, once you have the basic needs met, human beings have other needs. Like, you're not satisfied that you know you're going to have lunch after this service. Like, but if you were in sub-Saharan Africa with no food, no water, that's the only thing you'd be thinking about, right? Now, because we have the baseline needs met, there are other needs that pile on top of that, like safety. Do you have shelter? For example, belonging. Are you alone or do you have community you belong to? It's one of the reasons why we talk about community so much here. Or esteem, right? What he calls esteem. Biblically, this would be about identity. Do you understand who you are in Jesus? And then it goes to like self-actualization. 
purpose, meaning of your life. And then later, near the end of his life, Maslow added to the top of his pyramid pyramid, what he called transcendence. What I believe is Maslow came to a place where he realized there must be a God, right? And we are searching for him. Now, I share this with you because you're right. If you're physically hungry, you shouldn't eat that leather-bound book on your shelf. But as a human, you have needs that are deeper and more meaningful than lunch. Now, if you don't have lunch, this is why the next three weeks we're going to go through compassion immersion, which is like a celebration of all God's done um, for the good of the world through you, this community. Like, we want to meet those needs, those baseline needs. Most of us in this room don't have those needs. You know what you're going to have for lunch, or at least you know you're going to have lunch. So what that means is that there are greater, deeper human needs within you. And that's the bread that the word of God offers. No, you can't physically eat your iPhone and you have like your Bible app or whatever, right? But it will feed you. Not your iPhone, but the Bible. It will feed you. And it can sustain you. So the word of God is bread. The word of God sustains us on our journey toward identity and transcendence, the deep needs of human longing. The word of God is also a lamp. Psalm 119, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Interesting that it is a lamp and not a flashlight. Now, of course, back then they didn't have flashlights, but this is very intentional language. How far along can you see with a lamp? Not very far. We often want God's word to be a flashlight. Like I want to be able to turn that thing on and see 12 years down the line, right? It's like, ah, I see. That's where God's taking me. If God were to do that, it'd be wonderful for us in some ways, but what would it do? It would detract from from our understanding, our, our awareness and acknowledgement of our deep, constant need for him. And so his word is a lamp. It lights just a few steps ahead of us, but it does light the way. Um, As a pastor, I've done several visits to um, congregants and friends who are terminally ill, right? And it's one of the most heartbreaking and holy sort of spaces. There's a sacredness to it when somebody is near the end of their life. I remember several years ago at a previous church where I was on staff, I went to the hospital to visit uh, an older gentleman who was um, terminally ill. And I'm like this young pastor, and I was like in my mind prepping, like what beautiful thing can I say to this man to usher him in? Like I'm like crafting, I'm wordsmithing in my mind, right? And I walk in, and I start talking, and he says to me, he goes, I'm like, oh, okay, I, I should shut up now. <laughs> and then he says to me, he says, can you read me the Psalms? And so I was like, that is so much better than me talking. So I opened the Psalms and I read him the Psalms. And what I realized was that he didn't need me to talk his way. He didn't need me to speak comfort in his sort of tenuous situation. What he needed was the scriptures to light the path to eternity. And that's what the Bible does, not just toward the end of your life, but every moment of your life. His word is a lamp. God's word is also a sword. Ephesians 6, 10 and 11, and then verse 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is why, again, going back to Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, that was the first time, hey, tell these stones to become bread. But three times in the wilderness, the devil comes to Jesus and is like, hey, if you're really God, do this. And what does Jesus do every single time? He takes out a sword to battle the enemy, but the sword is the word. Three times Jesus says, no, it is written, it is written, it is written. This is one of the reasons why I actually think memorizing scripture matters so much, why it's so helpful. 
Charles Spurgeon once said, the Bible in the memory is better than the Bible in the bookcase. Sometimes you don't know, right? You don't know. Yesterday, some of you were here. Yesterday morning, we had the Reset Conference here. It was about 250 of you who joined us. And my friend Glenn Packiam, who's a pastor in Southern California, he was up here. And he said so many beautiful, profound things. But he said something that um, just I, has really stuck with me. And I'm paraphrasing him here, but basically he said, listen, the miracle of spiritual growth, the miracle of spiritual growth is not um, experiencing spontaneous virtue. What he meant by that is like, you're just living life ho-hum, something happens, and then spontaneously God like brings up this power in you. So Glenn was saying, that's not how it works. The miracle of spiritual growth is the embodying of sustained faithfulness, were his words. The whole point he was making is like, you don't go to the Bible when you're in crisis. You eat the Bible all the time. And when crisis comes, you are ready. That's what Jesus did. It is written, it is written, it is written. When the devil tempted him, you think Jesus was like, um, hold on, let me grab a scroll. Where's that part? Where's that part? It's like Deuteronomy or don't know. I don't know. Like, you think Jesus did that? No. The devil tempts him. He's like, no, God's word says, God's word says, God's word says, because it was in him. God's word is a sword. Finally, God's word is a scalpel. Hebrews 4, for the word of God is active, alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Let me just say something that I think is critically important, especially in today's sort of Twitterverse world. Uh, it's so shocking and sad to me that I see so many people, Christians included, who today want to weaponize the Bible to protect or promote their self-interests and attack anyone and all who disagree. The Bible is a sword, but the enemy you fight with that sword is not one another. It is the enemy of God, the devil himself. But more than that, the Bible is a scalpel. It's not intended for you to leverage and weaponize against one another. God wants to do surgery on you. He's not giving you his word so that you can weaponize it to cut down anybody who disagrees with you. He is giving you his word and it is a scalpel in his hands, not yours, to cut out the cancer in your heart, not theirs. How often do you let the scriptures do surgery on you? If this is you, I cannot say this more clearly. If you are weaponizing scripture to cut other Imago Dei humans down, stop. And instead, let God do surgery on you. What is broken in you? What is sinful in you? What is toxic in you? God, in his great love, longs to cut that out of you. We're so busy cutting each other. This is me too. This is self-indictment, you guys. I'm tempted to do this too. So let's stop. God's word is a scalpel to transform us. Going back to the 2 Timothy um, passage, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that, there's a so that, the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for what? For every good work. We don't read the Bible and study the scriptures just so we can know more. We read the Bible and study the scriptures to become and to do more. And I do not mean do more to earn God's love or grace. You can't earn it. To do more in terms of joining God more effectively in the beautiful work he's already up to in our world. N.T. Wright puts it this way, that the Bible is there to enable God's people to be equipped to do God's work in God's world. Eugene Peterson says Christian reading is participatory reading, receiving the words in such a way that they become the interior to our lives. They become interior to our lives. The rhythms and images becoming practices of prayer, acts of obedience, and ways of love. 
This is the invitation to eat this book, to let it be bread that sustains you, a lamp that lights the way forward for you, a sword by which you can uh, fight against the attacks of the enemy, and a scalpel that can do surgery on you. I'm going to invite Chris and the team to come back up. We're going to sing and respond together. But a couple of um, practical takeaways and invitations. First, I would invite you, if you're new to the Bible, I would invite you, try to read the Bible as a whole. Uh, our friends at the Bible Project up in Portland, Oregon, Tim Mackey, he, he, I'm quoting him here. He says, the Bible is a unified story leading to Jesus. These 66 books, it is one story leading to Jesus. So maybe that's where you are today. Maybe you've read bits and pieces of the Bible, but you've never really read the whole thing as a story. I would encourage you, don't do it alone. There are sections of the Bible that are really weird and tricky on the surface, and it's great. It's so helpful to read in community. Um, And then I would also encourage you to read the story in detail. You know, some of you are familiar with like Lectio Divina, or just, I grew up in the quiet time era. And as much as people want to mock that, Man, it's a game changer to spend time just with your favorite cup of coffee and a text of scripture in the morning and sit and linger with the Lord and let him speak to you through his word. So a couple of practical invitations. First, um, I said parts of the Bible are really strange. Uh, The first five books of the Bible is called the Pentateuch, the books of Moses. Um, They're hard to understand. So on February 15th, we're offering a Bible lab. Uh, here at our Saratoga campus, Dave Tish, who's our South Hills teaching pastor and uh, recently graduated from Western Seminary in biblical theology. He's going to deep dive with us through the first five books of the Bible. And I think if you want to start sort of reading the Bible at the beginning, um, uh, this might be a great lab to check out before or as you do that. And then finally, you heard Sebastian's story earlier. Again, he's a part of something called Discover the Bible. It's a group of people who try to read the entire Bible in a year in these cohorts and keep one another accountable. There are these monthly Zooms with pastors where we respond to some of the tough topics and all of that. So that's just, those are just a couple of practical invitations. Let me close with this. When I was a youth pastor, um, you know, every May or June was like graduation season where, you know, graduating seniors. And I would be going to high school graduations all the time in June. And I remember one year there was one kid named Mike who was graduating high school. And he was so excited because he had an older brother who was like seven or eight years older than him who was living in the Pacific uh, Northwest. I don't remember like Portland or Seattle or something like that. It was many years ago. And his brother, Mike's older brother, was like Mike's hero, you know? I was like, man. And he kept telling me, he's like, yeah, because I was going to go to his graduation. He's like, yeah, I can't wait for you to meet my brother. My brother's going to be there. He's flying down for my graduation. He's the best. I really want you to meet him, all this stuff. And then um, the day of the graduation, I get there, and I find Mike's parents, and then we're kind of like waiting for the graduation to start. And I'm talking to them, and they tell me, they say, uh, yeah, like it's kind of a bummer. Mike's really disappointed because his brother's flight got canceled. So he's not going to be able to make it. I'm like, oh my gosh, what a bummer, right? The graduation starts, and then as the graduation is happening, this young man walks up, like almost runs up, and hugs Mike's family. And then I'm watching, and I realize, just from context clues, I think that's the brother. What the heck? I thought his Mrs. Flight, he's like way up there, hours away, you know, Seattle or Portland, wherever. Like what what in the world? Long story short, Mike graduates, all the family, all this youth group kids, we're all taking pictures, hanging out. Long story short, he missed his flight. So then he got in his car and he drove 14 hours to get to the graduation. And then Mike and his older, Mike's introducing me. This is my brother. This is the guy I'm talking about. It's so awesome. I'm like, dude, this is amazing. And he says, essentially, I'm paraphrasing him here, but he says to his younger brother, he's like, yeah, I missed the finest stuff. I'm like, I kept my word. I kept my word. So I told you I was going to be here, and I'm here. Like, I cannot tell you what's ahead in your life. I don't know what tomorrow looks like for you. 
I don't know if that job situation is going to get worked out. I don't know if that relational um, pain is going to get resolved. I don't know if your marriage is going to get fixed or if your kids are going to grow to be the sorts of kids you long for them to be. I don't know if you're going to achieve all of your hopes and dreams. I don't know if the Niners are going to win today or lose. I don't know. None of us know. What I do know is this, God has spoken and every word he speaks, he will stay true to his word. And that's all we need to know. That's all we need to know. So let's stand and sing together. We take him at his word, it's trustworthy, it's an anchor and a light to our feet. Let's celebrate. Let's sing this together. Come on, here we go. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Your way is the only way for me. It's a narrow road that leads to life. But I want to be on it It's a narrow road But the mercy is wide Cause you're good at your promise Come on! I'll take you at your
put our faith and trust and anchor on his word. Amen? Amen. You can go in and grab a seat. We take him at his word. I love the words of one of the lyric writers in the the Old Testament. The psalmist says this, God, you do the things that you promise. Everybody say amen to that. And I'm so thankful with all my heart. You pulled me from the brink of death, my feet from the cliff edge of doom, and now I stroll at leisure with God in the sunlit fields of life. So poetic, so beautiful. God is faithful. And when he touches our hearts, thankfulness, we, in turn, it goes into uh, generosity. And so we like to practice generosity, so we're going to have uh, receive an offering here today. That's our celebration of gratitude back to God for the thankfulness because of all of his promises that he's been faithful to in our lives. If you are new, don't feel any pressure that we have expectations that you give. We're really glad, like Jay said, really glad uh, that you're with us. But for those of us who call Westgate home, this is a rhythm that we do that's formative in our spiritual growth in life. So we practice giving. And part of what helps us do that, we've been using a liturgy. That's just a simple way for us to collectively remind ourselves why we give. So would you read along with me today? Holy Father, there is nothing we have that you have not given us. All we have belongs to you. To spend all on ourselves and to give without cost is the way of the world. But sacrifice is the way of Christ. Help us to steward our resources in such a way that you might entrust us with true riches. Help us withstand the delusion of riches and grow in gratitude and generosity for your glory and for the good of the world. Amen. Amen. Hey, Jay's going to come in just a second. Um, Before he does, if you're here and as he was kind of talking about pressing in and needing the promises of God and God showing up, we have a prayer team that's in the prayer room. They would be happy to pray with you. Before you get in your car or before you grab your kids, if you want just a little sacred space to kind of do some business with God, uh, that space is available for you. Jay, why don't you come up? Let's all stand and I want to send us from here uh, into the week ahead with a simple blessing as we go. As we go from this place, um, may we go with ears and hearts and minds open to the God who has spoken and is still speaking. And may we take the time to bring down the noise of the world and culture and our own sort of inner voices and to eat the book in which God speaks life to us to sustain us, to light the way ahead, um, to give us protection, and to do work in us. Grace, peace, love. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. I was blinded. You gave me eyes to see. I was going under. You reached out.
much love, so much grace. Come on now. Can I get a witness? Somebody in this place. Come on now. Can I get a witness? So much love, so much grace. Come on now. Can I get a witness? Somebody in this place. Come on now. Can I get a witness? Yeah. 
Say is holy. 